I'm Melissa Langdon and this is my colleague Leah Irving. Um, we've taken quite an informal approach, probably to also reflect the approach we're taking with partnerships at the moment at Curtin University. Um, but we'll start off by introducing ourselves. So, yeah, I, I've recently joined Curtin Managing Learning Partnerships and Pathways. But prior to this role, I was working at the WA Museum as engagement manager, and prior to that, an academic in communications and media. So um, I guess this background has influenced my approach to partnerships too. Um, and Leah and I work together in Curtin Learning and Teaching. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Leah Irving. Um, I work at Curtin University. I've been there for nine years in um, a range of positions, but mainly to do with uh, learning engagement. I actually have a, um, a visual arts background uh, and in sculpture and that, so um, visual arts kind of really informs a lot of what I'm doing uh, in my teaching and learning as well. Mm. So Lee and I have recently started working together, um, you know, to look at how we can build collaborative partnerships um, and we're currently exploring a partnership within Curtin Learning and Teaching which brings together academics from across the university but it also is working with a university overseas to look at how we can talk about Indigenous narratives. Um, but before we look at that case study which Leah will address, I'd like to talk a little bit about our approach and how we've looked at building these kinds of cultural relationships from a tertiary perspective. So having worked in a museum environment, um, I'm very conscious of poor past practices, both by museums and universities, in terms of how um, they've told other people's cultural stories, and particularly uh, marginalised people, um, Indigenous people, for example. Um, this is a diorama of Native American artefacts in glass cases, which I guess seems to epitomise, you know, what I'm talking about of um, you know, a fairly privileged organisation acquiring artefacts and putting them on display, often without little dialogue or interaction or voice from the people who own those artefacts. And, you know, and to this day there are a lot of debates both within museums but also within universities about how best to tell Indigenous and um, stories from other cultures as well. Essentially what we're trying to do within Curtin Learning and Teaching is um, work with academics within our university to learn more about best practices towards sharing cultural stories, um, but also to build partnerships with cultural institutions, um, you know, for example, the WA Museum, um, to look at ways that we can collaborate in the sharing of knowledge, but also in the, sh the telling of stories. And then another key element here is involving community too, so that community members are quite actively involved in the sharing of their stories. I think a key role for us is to look at how we can help facilitate the conversation rather than dictate the terms of the conversation so that it's not that kind of top-down approach and is a genuine two-way dialogue. This involves a lot of time, um, and it involves a lot of communication, a lot of listening to um, what community members would like to share from their stories. Uh, a similar approach actually is currently being adopted by the new museum too, in terms of presenting stories for the new museum. And allowing people space to share their narratives as well. This kind of approach of listening, building trust, um, you know, having genuine conversations makes for a much more open, inclusive and consultative practice. And what we're trying to achieve here are genuine two-way dialogues or approaches. Um, so I'd like to share with you um, a case study that uh, um, I started about four years ago. Um, but it's part of a whole new kind of approach to, um, to learning that's moving away from uh, like Curtin has progressively been moving away from uh, the lecture and uh, tutorial into flipped classroom, like most universities are today. Um, so I was um, more interested in um, uh, learning that's uh, situated within a context, and I worked with um, in health sciences 
on the Common Core curriculum. And part of that was uh, a unit called Indigenous Culture and Health. And I worked with uh, Kim Scott and uh, Marion uh, Kickett on that to develop that curriculum. So as part of that, um, there was uh, like a, um, a topic, I suppose, that was trying to convey uh, the importance of um, place to and land to uh, Indigenous communities and that. So this is really bringing human rights back into Wajak uh, uh, Noongar country. And, uh, and to engage students in, uh, in a much more um, empathetic and experiential kind of way, uh, it seemed uh, strange to kind of teach them about something in a classroom. So um, I looked into uh, some technologies um, augmented reality to and, and location-based augmented reality that um, could place the stories back in the landscape. So um, I worked with Len Collard, who um, would have um, done your um, welcome to country yesterday. And Len and I uh, went around and, and uh, Len, I recorded Len telling stories in specific places and that, and then embedded those in a, um, a web service that was available through a free um, augmented reality app. So as students go out into um, the landscape, so this was around uh, Perth and uh, there was one up in the Fremantle area, uh, they uh, can see themselves, they can see their position on the map. So that red dot um, shows them where they are and they can find it. So it's, it's also uh, a kind of a, uh, introducing a, a more of a curiosity and a playfulness into the thing, so like a discovery um, kind of uh, pedagogy. So those uh, markers there are different kinds of media. So uh, video, audio, um, there. We didn't use still images because um, it didn't seem really relevant. So it was about um, students going out into that landscape and experiencing that, that cultural story in the place that was actually relevant. So as they got to one of those markers, they uh, could click on that or I could set it so that it downloaded automatically. Um, and Len would uh, tell a story and he'd usually um, speak um, in Noongar and uh, in Noongar language and then explain what the story meant and that. So as students would hold the, um, their smartphone up listening to Len, it was framed within this urban, urbanised uh, kind of landscape. And so what we're kind of doing is, is peeling that, that top layer of a colonialised urban landscape and, and looking at, at the, uh, the culture and that that was underneath. And that's not to say that that's below, but just that that, that top layer is obscuring it at times. So ideally, it would be to work um, in, a, in a sense with, uh, um, with a, a blue screen or a green screen or something like that so that... Uh, the person speaking would be actually against that landscape. And so this was a very minimal, sort of um, quickly put together pilot. So that's um, you know, one of the, uh, the videos I've experienced. But um, I ran a, um, a short survey with uh, students that uh, participated in this. And um, so they were, this wasn't something that they had to do. It was something that they could choose to do. It was sort of a part of uh, their studies. <coughs> And the ones that did go out and see it, the, the um, reflective um, experiences that they brought back from that were really amazing, a lot of them, especially international students, but a lot of uh, local students had never heard these kinds of stories that were embedded because we hear big narratives in that, but we don't hear smaller narratives. And um, one of the, um, the, the narratives with Marion talking about um, her auntie taking her to King's Park and, and um, telling her about the... Um, the Wagle sto uh, stone of um, um, scale that was on the ground and, and explaining the story. And, and Marion looked down and said, but it's not there anymore. Oh, I can't see it. And she said, oh, no, that's where the brewery is now. Mm -hmm. There was a rock that was there and has been moved. So it was kind of like this, you know, you're in, in, uh, transferred this story and then all of a sudden you're brought back to reality that that is uh, kind of just non-existent anymore. Um, so... Um, this has been going for all, uh, about four years and it's, it was, as I said, it was a pilot and it's um, brought up a lot of other ways that we uh, will look at working and um, at the time students were saying it's great to go out there but, you know, it'd be nice to just do it around campus. So I was asking around, you know, who, uh, you know, um, who belongs to this country, what are, you know, the importance of this country and that and nobody kind of knew but as part of the uh, Curtin Greater um, uh, uh, greater city uh, 
uh, practice the, the project. They have employed um, consultants to, to work with um, long, uh, local Noongar people and, and find out what's happening with our uh, campus. And it turns out there's this rich, rich, and it's, you know, like the whole of the country is anyway, really rich kind of um, uh, indigenous narratives and that that are um, through this whole campus. And so we're going to be uh, augmenting that right the whole canter, so turning it into um, a learning landscape. Um, but it's really, uh, as Melissa was saying, about um, continually um, consulting and working and, and developing partnerships and developing that, that trust that, um, you know, that we are not just um, taking over again. Mm. I think, um, so this new project that Leah mentioned as part of Greater Curtain is Quite an important one because I guess it shifts how the university works and we could look at a parallel of how museums have worked, um, of also exploring their own places rather than exploring other places, looking actually this, at the site in which you know, they are located and broadening learning experiences for young people, in this case you know, students, um, although we are also working closely with schools and bringing schools onto campus too to think about the site as a place for learning and learning about um, Indigenous stories too. And where possible, learning firsthand from Indigenous people, um, you know, staff on campus as well as Indigenous students. So our role here, you know, from a partnership perspective, is really to try to help facilitate conversations between people, between the university, um, community partners, schools, you know, Indigenous people, rather than to dictate the terms. And I think that represents quite a big shift in how partnerships have been construed in the past, certainly both from museums and um, universities, which have tended to have, you know, ivory tower type approaches. So, yeah, it's a really exciting new way of working. The challenge is that um, building these relationships takes time. Um, certainly when I worked at the museum, you know, you're working to often government deadlines and quite um, a Western way of thinking about time and budgets and imperatives and um, you can't put a time on how long it takes to build relationship and trust so that these <coughs> stories can be shared. Um, but the principle of, a, of providing people with space to tell their own stories, whether it's within a museum or a tertiary context, is a really important one. And I guess it signals a new approach for how we hope to map cultural stories in the future. Mm. Mm. Mm.